that uh, the purpose of uh, the, pre the present I'm going to, pre to present you today uh, is to assess the role of uh, the Russian nationalist in the Ukrainian armed conflict. This is the first part of a broader research that seeks to research the outcomes of Russian extra-parliamentary nationalist patriotic opposition to, uh, on Russia's foreign policy and on Vladimir Putin's costly strategy, as it was characterized, in invading Ukraine. Um, so I'm focusing only on the extra-parliamentary nationalist patriotic opposition, uh, which is a wide spectrum of nationalist organizations, they may be parties, movements or milieus, who are not in the Duma, as well as their allies within the Duma. Um, why am I choosing this? Because uh, this part, because I want them to be representatives of grassroots nationalist thinking in Russia and not to be Kremlin's puppets. Um, so this is a term used by the Russian nationalists themselves when they're describing their own organizations. And so this, uh, these movements vary, vary substantially in the level of authoritarianism from democratic to far-right groups. But they do have two things in common. So they consider themselves to be part of the country's opposition and other oppositional forces perceive them as such. And they, have a native, they share a nativist ideology. Except uh, the other Russia, which is Limonov's party, which uh, Drugaya Rasiya, uh, the former National Bolshevik Party of Russia, which um, made a substantial shift, ideological and discursive shift in the 2000s, and became part of the liberal opposition. So the significance of researching such a topic is that the nationalists, together with the liberals, are the only se segments of grassroots opposition left today in Russia. Um, and in the last years, the nationalists have moved from the fringe, the fringe to the center of Russian politics, as we have seen with uh, the Bolotnaya protests, for example, where they played a very significant role. Um, and contrary to the pro-Kremlin nationalist organizations, uh, the extra-parliamentary ones are not controlled by the regime, or are as less as possible controlled by the regime, to put it better. And so therefore, their actions cannot be easily foreseen nor easily tamed by the regime. Um, at the same time, research on how internal and external non-state actors interrelate and the outcomes of this interrelation is scarce, especially in transitional settings. So one reason to, of, of this is that there is no easy access to non-state actors like the nationalist movements. And um, we have little official data available. So at this first stage, my research will contribute to identifying the most significant uh, non-state nationalist actors of the former Soviet of the post-communist world, Russia, and uh, on understanding their ideology and their positioning towards the events in Ukraine. Uh, my data comes from primary sources or the websites and the blogs of, uh, of act nationalist actors and their organizations, and from secondary data, mainly from uh, SOVA Center, which is a watchdog of Russian extremism based in, in Moscow. And, um, and I also interviewed at uh, the time that I had, um, uh, that I was uh, doing this research, which was a couple, I started a couple of weeks ago. I managed to interview the, the spokesman of um, uh, Druga Yarasilla, uh, Alexandra Vern from the distance, and also Spanish journalist um, Pablo Gonzalez, who has been uh, visited Ukraine on various occasions and came back two weeks ago from, from the battlefield. Um, so at a later stage, I hope that my research will help, help us assess the role of non-state actors and their agency in transitional settings where nation building and state building have not been stabilized for whatever reasons. And so on the role of their transnational, national, uh, trans, transnational nationalist networks in ethnic conflict, especially with a brother nation, as the Ukrainian nation is concerned. Um, so the term uh, Russian Spring, as you might uh, have heard, uh, is a term which is attributed to Yegor Halmagorov, which is a well-known ideologue of contemporary Russian nationalism. Close, he's moving to the National Democrats. Um, he used this term at, on September 24, 2014, uh, when the pro-Russian demonstration in Sevastopol started. Um, it is an effort, it's a clear effort to, co to connect the Arab Revolution to the situation in Crimea. 
Um, in his provocative article of the same day, uh, with the title Crimea and Novorossiya's Betrayal Will Kill Our Nation, um, and Holmogorov basically <clears throat> argues that Crimean residents will either be liberated by the Russian Spring or massacred from privy sector and the Crimean Tatars who see Russians as natural slaves. Soon, the term Russian Spring was taken over by main mainstream newspapers, Ukrainian ones also, like Ria Novosti Ukraine. And um, the term Novorossiya started to be used by Russia's highest authorities, uh, implying thus histor historical ties of Russia with the region of southeastern Ukraine. Uh, President uh, Putin said, uh, stated, quote, that we must do everything to help these people protect their rights and independently determine their own destiny. Uh, whereas uh, others, um, other um, ideologues who move close to the Kremlin circles, uh, like the director of Russian Institute for Strategic Studies, Leonid Reshetnikov, was even clearer. He stated that Novorossians will never be part of Ukraine again because they do not want to be Ukrainians. So at the, at the same time, we see state efforts, centralized efforts to counterweight the Russophobia fomented by the Western media. And a, a series of new formed news agencies pop up uh, with the name of Novorossiya, Novorossiya Today, um, uh, Russian Spring, Ruskaya Vesna. Um, but the, despite of the fact that the term was created and was first circulated by nationalist circles, the nationalists, the Russian nationalists, became divided over the issue. And there are three dominant approaches. The first one are the supporters, uh, who are the majority of, of the national patriots. Um, the pejorative ter term that their enemies use for them is Vatniks. Uh, they are against the Maidan, and they perceive the events in Ukraine as Russophobic and neo-Nazi coup which a conflict against Russia and basically motivated by the West. Um, within this tendency, there, there's also controversy because some of them do not recognize Ukraine as a separate nation, wh while as others see the conflict between Banderite Ukrainians of central Western Ukraine against Russians of the Southeast. Um, and there's also controversy on Putin's motivation whether he, he, his foreign policy are led, are led by his interest in protecting Russians or, be, or, or whether he does it to curtail political freedoms in Russia and to create a, ne a negative image for the nationalist patriotic opposition within Russia. Um, or some of them say that there's a plot between Putin and the West in order to divide in Ukraine into spheres of uh, influence. The opponents of Russian sp Spring um, also called Banderites by their enemies, um, are those in favor of Euro the Euromaidan who perceived it as a grassroots mo movement that aimed to overthrow uh, the corrupt regime of Yanukovych. Uh, it is a model of civic resist resistance against authoritarianism, which they would uh, love to import to Russia in order to overthrow its authoritarian regime. Um, so the, this, uh, this segment believes that the Russian government artificially created polarization on lines of ethnicity, uh, while in, in reality it is an ideological conflict between those who want an independent nation state uh, versus those who want to reestablish the Soviet Union. Um, uh, in some, they, want, uh, they believe that Ukraine will be better off and, th and the secessionist regions will be better off under Kiev's government, uh, then under Putin's anti-Russian government. And then there is this third uh, tendency, um, which is nothing and everything of the above, uh, of the above at the same time. Uh, the majority of nationalists, non-aligned nationalists, um, some of them believe that it's a Zionist conspiracy against the Slavs, and so the war in Donbass is, is a war of resistance. And um, some others believe that they cheer the war because they see it as a very good opportunity of both the Vatniks and what they call the Ukro Turks to kill each other, basically. And uh, this is very widespread between the autonomous neo Nazis. So uh, we'll, go, we'll go now uh, to this slide that offers an overview of the most significant uh, national patriotic organization in Russia and their positioning towards the Russian Spring. So from the broader nationalist constellation in Russia, which includes dozens of organizations, I extracted a sample of four based on their success in terms of followers, frequency of mobilization, scholarly consensus, and media coverage that they enjoy. 
Um, the first one, I'm going to, to be very short. Uh, the first two organizations are from the 90s. Um, the Russian National Unity um, is uh, of, the, of Alexander Barkashov was the biggest and the most significant organization of the 90s with neo-Nazi characteristics and strict hierarchy around its leader. Um, it was a disciplined and centralized organization with material assets investing in violence related resources like security films, training halls, martial arts centers. And it not only offered military training to its members, but it also developed a military potential. So it penetrated the army, the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Regional Administrations, and was traditionally very active at the borders of the Russian Federation with Ukraine and Northern Caucasus. Um, but the authoritarianism of its leader, who constantly created internal schisms, schisms led uh, to, its, to the gradual disappearance of, of the movement. Uh, the second one is uh, the National Bolshevik Party, uh, uh, that was le uh, formed by Alexander uh, Dugin, who le le later le left it and made his own Eurasianist movement, um, and Limonov. Edward Limonov, uh, who is still the leader of uh, what later became Drukaya Russia, um, it transformed radically, and as its spokesperson also underlined, he said, "Look, not neither me nor Limonov are ethnic imperialists. We are just imperialists. So, and they're not co cooperating with national organizations in in their public actions. They're having their own strategies, and they make it clear that they're a pro-revolutionary organization." that have nothing to do with the rest of the national patriotic opposition. And from the 2000s, the most significant uh, movements is first the movement against illegal immigration, um, which offers an innovative proposal with a structureless network based on the internet and with an undefined catch-all ideology against illegal immigrants. Uh, that may include different nationalist ideologies on, in its rank, from neo-Nazi to national democratic ones. Uh, this, this movement spread the slogan, Russia to Russians, which became widespread in Russia in the last years. And the final one is the um, Russian People's Movement of, of uh, ideologue, uh, nationalist ideologue Konstantin Krylov, uh, which presents itself as a civil rights organization for the protection of the rights of the Russians. And it's, it is uh, a national democratic uh, organization that wants to uh, introduce the standards of Western European nation states in Europe. Um, so the two first, uh, the, uh, the two fir all the organizations are in favor of the Russian Spring, except of uh, the movement against legal immigration, which was later transferred in Ruskia. And um, they have been engaged either, uh, most of them uh, offer combat training to their members, and some of them have even sent tro troops, which is the last part of my presentation. Um, the relations of these movements uh, to war in Donbass. So the numbers of uh, Russian nationalist vol volunteers vary. Um, they are from 1,000 to 3,000 at the very best case, according to journalist Pablo Gonzalez, including volunteers, doctors, and what he said, war tourists. War tourists are these pe pe people who come from the Russian Federation to basically make tourism uh, have a ride, shoot with weapons at, at, the, at the front lines, eat the soldiers' foods, and then go back to Russia after having paid what it has to be paid for. It. Um, so uh, the nationalists are uh, very roughly estimated about 10% from the total of the volunteers from the whole Soviet Union, from former Soviet Union, which will, in the best, in the very best case, is estimated from 10 to, to 15,000 uh, members. Um, according to different sources, uh, Sova Center and Maren Laruel, who uh, conducted interviews in Moscow uh, this summer, um, the, the Russian nationalists are between 100 and 200. Um, and Laruel makes, makes a very important distinction between volunteers and mercenaries. So the volunteers are usually young men driven by their ideological romanticism with no substantial military training, if any and usually without families, whereas the mercenaries are war professionals, um, usually officers of former security services with battle experience in Afghanistan, Chechenia, and Yugoslavia, and who are unable to reintegrate to civil life. These are mostly related to Russian national unity of Barkashov. 
So Barkashov came to the forefront when Pavel Gubarev proclaimed himself leader of Donbas People's Militia uh, on March 3rd. Uh, Gubarev was a former member of the Russian National Unity. And Barkashov um, uh, is reported to, to have been living in Donetsk since September. And uh, there are also these militias formed, we know it because of the distinctive armbands. Uh, Drugaya Russia, on the other side, has also made its own international brig brigades. The founder was the same, Alexander Averin, uh, who also thought, considered it was his duty to, to fight. So he went there to, fi to fight in the infantry and artillery in Luhansk. Um, he said that the bulk of the army are local residents, but they're also volunteers from, from the former USSR uh, countries like Belarus, Kazakhstan, Latvia, Moldavia, Hungary, also from Serbia, but as well from Western European countries, Germany, Italy, Scotland, Ireland. I also found an article on Spanish volunteers. Uh, among them, there are Eurasianists and ultra-leftists. Okay, so the end, but- To conclude. To conclude, yes. <laughs> they also offer humanitarian <laughs> aid. And to conclude, <laughs> um, so we learned from from my study, or I hope we, we learned, that the ideological base of the rebel forces who are fighting in Donbass next to the local residents is very different. The right-wing nationalist with a clear perception of belonging to the white race and to the orthodox nation, whose aim is to overthrow the, Ki the Ki Kiev's government. And there are left-wing uh, nationalists who remain loyal to Soviet ideals. There are also young rebels in their early 20s who feel affiliation to Russia through football. And Chechens fighting for a multicultural Russia which will give more powers to the Muslim minority, for example. Um, this may confuse the Western observers, but it does not really matter in the battlefield, as I, have, I was informed. So will so different ideologies manage to coexist in the long term when supposedly the war stops or will each one claim territorial rights and open a new wave of armed confrontation in the region furthermore however paradoxical as it may sound the war in ukraine divided the nationalist scene and the opponents of russian spring the russia the ruskia that i, I presented you before have been silenced voluntarily or put aside by their former allies that means that the dominant ideology of the national patriots uh, is the protection of Russian population in Novorossiya and war, which is Kremlin's official policy towards Ukraine. Uh, meaning that if a uh, critic from the only opposition left is getting more scarce, then Vladimir Putin's policies gain legitimacy, especially the, his expansionist ones. And, and finally, the extra-parliamentary Natspats, mm -hmm. Okay. No, I'm sorry. Uh, let, let's, let's let it to, to the discussion. We'll, and, and the final part, it will be led to the discussion. <laughs> Thank you.